My name is Viraj Parikh. I'd like to welcome you all to the second annual Boston Symposium on Economics, sponsored by the Northeastern University Economic Society. I would really like to thank all of the great directors who made this event possible. Um, Rashad, Maria, Jeff, Kirsten, Vinny, Vibob, Stefan, as well as our advisor, Peter Simon, Cheryl Fonville, and the chair of the economics department up front here, Professor James Dana. So can we please get a round, or a round of applause for these people? Thank you. We are thrilled to have such great turnout two years in a row. There were so many friends I invited, though, who didn't say, who didn't want to come. They said, you know, Raj, I just don't know anything about economics. One of my friends, Ivy Fisher, I invited her and she responded. She says, Raj, I like clothes and photography. I don't know anything about economics. And I told her, you know, it's really hard to convince people like you that this event, the Boston Symposium on Economics, is not entirely about economics. Economics is a social science by nature, you see. It studies the relationships between buyers and sellers, encompassing sociology, anthropology, ethics, philosophy, finance, and more relatively recently in the context of history, it's, it's grown to encompass mathematics and statistics. This is, a type, this is the type of economics that scared away Ivy. This is why I would like to frame the theme of this event around a different particular type of economics. The term political economy is a type of economy that has relation to the community or state. To put it in a more current context, the political economy is an economy that has a relation to the globe. As an economic system is illustrative of what societal structure a population will clearly mold to. If you think about history, the economic structures of feudalism, mercantilism, and more currently capitalism, all were um, illustrative of what, of what society uh, how society is structured. This event seeks to provide all of us with diverse perspectives on what the future of our global society may look like, not in the detail of econometric models or perspectives on the Malthusian theory of population, instead from the diverse perspective of three well-experienced, or sorry, three experienced, well-versed, and extremely bright individuals, a financier, an economist, and a linguist, each of whom have their own story to tell. We are privileged to be able to draw from these talks and form our own opinion on what the future of global capitalism may entail. So what I say to those people like Ivy Fisher, who have decided to be elsewhere tonight, is that they not ought to be afraid of the words economics or economy, for it is a word that explains so much. It explains the way the world is, the way we as individuals may want the world to be, and the way things may realistically turn out to be. It is a shame to not be aware and heedful of what the future may hold, be it changed in this generation, the generation of my children, the generation of my grandchildren. It is tradition that things will always change. So let us continue to be curious and hopefully better prepared for what change lies ahead. Thank you for that introduction, Viraj. Um, my name is Stefan Kloss, and uh, what I like to say is every year, the Economic Society, we like to hold a symposium to investigate a topic that reaches beyond the realm of traditional economic study. And uh, this year's event will th feature three different speakers from three different backgrounds who will um, speak on the future of global capitalism, a very wide-reaching uh, topic that tackles many different facets. And each, speech, each, each speaker will speak at, uh, will tackle a different facet of the topic, starting with our first speaker, uh, Bill Cheney. Bill uh, is the current chief economist of John Hancock and Manny Life, uh, graduated from Oxford and in 1987, or sorry. And he has um, spent years working uh, in Kenya as an economist and statistician, and is currently uh, located in Boston as the Chief Economist of Manulife. So without further ado, we'd like to welcome Bill Cheney. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, good afternoon, Stefan. Um, I'm honored to be here on this, this platform with two very distinguished other speakers. Um, and it's a pleasure for me to get to come and talk about something as sort of big and global as, as this question. Uh, as a practicing economist in the financial world, um, my normal life is focused on you know, the current month, the current quarter, and maybe the medium term is one year out, and long term is anything more than two years. So talking about the future of capitalism gives me a chance to step back and look at forest for a change. Um, and when I look at the world, uh, just dive right in. Um, in 2013, it seems as though capitalism is pretty much triumphant. Um, it's across the globe, and in my opinion, which I will come back to, it seems to be set for another century. Uh, I am still inclined to say that that's probably a good thing, and let me get into that. Uh, first, and I think this is a the the thesis I'll be coming back to as I keep talking, uh, capitalism is really the only genuine alternative to something worse. Capitalism has a myriad of flaws, some of which I'll get into talking about. <coughs> Uh, but the fact is, it's an alternative to a system where you have kings or high priests or central planners or somebody to tell you what you have to do and what will get done and who will get it. Uh, capitalism is the alternative to all the bad things that have happened through most of history. Uh, furthermore, it works. Uh, there's a classic the, the sort of the classic quote on the importance and the power of capitalism comes from Karl Marx. Um, you know, mid 19th century in the Communist Manifesto, he said that the bourgeoisie during scarce 100 years has created more colossal productive forces than all preceding generations together. And he's absolutely right. And capitalism's pervasive strength, however, which Marx I don't think really did quite see. The reason that it survived Marxism and sort of come out the other side is that it isn't obviously a system or an ideology at all. Um, it's kind of what you get when you reject the idea that kings or the proletariat or somebody rules by divine right. It's kind of the negation. It's what you get when you start going beyond might is right and trying to figure out some basic moral principles. Which may sound odd to you, I'm sort of coming back to morality in the context of capitalism. Um, but, you know, if you start thinking about basic moral principles that might govern, you know, the construction of a reasonable society, without too many nuances, you should be free to do what you want to do, you should be able to keep what you've got and do what you like with it. Taking stuff by force is wrong, people should do what they promise to do. You go through that kind of list of principles and you tend to evolve fairly quickly from that to some set of ideas around private property, contract law, finance, inheritance, government, taxes, the whole paraphernalia of the modern economy. Uh, and that's what Adam Smith talked about in the late 18th century. That's his whole idea that with some basic moral principles, I mean, he was a moral philosopher, basically, you end up with a system which seems to generate a productive economy and provide materially better than any other system that went before it. It's not great, it's not fair, it's not just, it's not anything like that in principle, but it is an efficient and productive system. Now, there are other quotes from Karl Marx, which I could get into, where he talks about how the ruling ideas of society are determined by the ruling clubs, which basically comes down to the point that here am I, I work for a financial services company, a large multinational conglomerate in a capitalist economy. So that probably means that my ideas are pretty much conditioned by the status quo and by the existing system. And I have to concede that. I mean, I, I'm not 
able to step out of my place in time and completely. But I do think, again, that, the, that it's very important to realize that capitalism has been this amazingly effective way to provide all the material goodies that we take for granted in a way that no other system has really ever been able to approach. So what's the outlook? Let's go to look into the future. Um, I would like to believe, as a, as a person, as a human being, that we in the West pretty much have enough stuff at this point in history. You know, I mean, I wish we could transition to a society that was less driven by competitive acquisitiveness. Um, I especially despise things like the creation of artificial desires by advertising. But it seems to me that we are, in fact, psychologically hardwired for scarcity. Um, in just the same way that people seem to eat too much fat and herbs when they're available, it seems like people relentlessly desire more goods and services. They always want more stuff. Um, I, as an aside, I suppose I should be happy about that since economics is kind of the study of scarcity. And if we all decided that we had more than enough of everything already, uh, the subject of economics would start to evaporate. Um, but aside from that, it seems pretty clear that human nature is such that capitalism is not about to evaporate. Um, I'm pretty confident about the survival of capitalism in the West. We like the level of basic freedoms that those basic moral principles give us, and we behave as if we desperately need more stuff. As George Carlin used to say, then we need a bigger house to hold all this stuff. Um, so I have no doubt that in Western countries, you know, democracies, however you want to characterize them, you're going to see capitalism for surviving and prospering into the indefinite future, barring some footnotes. Um, I'm actually just as confident about the survival and prospering of capitalism in the emerging markets in developing countries. My perception is that people in most developing countries want to be like us. Now, I, I realize it's kind of a chauvinistic statement. I'm not talking about governments necessarily. I'm not talking about ruling elites and the intelligentsia. I'm talking about the masses of the people in developing countries. They want cars. They want TVs. Uh, they want all the paraphernalia right up to cosmetics and, you know, soap operas and reality shows. And in due course, they want more living space and cleaner environment, and eventually they want political rights, too. Um, I think all those things are a natural evolution that is fed, that sort of is fed by capitalism and the mechanisms of capitalism and feeds back into, into more capitalism, because people get rich and start businesses and produce new things and, yes, stimulate new artificial demands. Um, of course, the road to the sort of capitalist nirvana of consumer goodies and personal freedoms, that, or at least of the kind that we view as freedoms here, is fraught with potholes. Um, I don't think ever, any country ever got to be even moderately decent without going through a traumatic period of breaking down old social bonds, cruelty, exploitation, and violence. And unfortunately, I don't think any country is ever going to make that transition to be a modern industrial society without going through those kinds of really kind of brutal phases. Um, However, I guess my moral qualms about how we reach capitalism, what it takes to go through to get there, are mitigated by the belief that pre-industrial societies are even worse. That the bigotry and xenophobia and cruelty of other forms of social organization have generally been worse. Um, and certainly I don't regard the non-capitalist forms of the world today as some kind of even that we should be looking for lessons from. So, where does this take us in the future? Well, the fact that we're not going back to before capitalism, that capitalism is going to preserve, it's going to survive and prosper, doesn't tell us what it's going to look like. And there have been lots of 
different flavors of capitalism over the years. I mean, the late 19th century Britain was one kind of laissez-faire uh, model of Eastern theory. Um, you had Germany was always more centralized. France and Japan had a different view of life. Hong Kong was the Wild West. Lots of different models. Um, in the past 50 years, the US economic model, I mean US wealth essentially, made a very appealing model for governments in the rest of the world that were actually oriented towards economic growth, which obviously isn't everybody. In the next half century, as we look forward, you know, in the 21st century, the American model may not be quite so compelling. Uh, the rise of China definitely tempts people to believe that a different form of capitalism may be more to their liking or more successful. Uh, you know, if, if we have a trend rate of growth of 3% and the Chinese have a trend rate of growth of 7%, you can do the math pretty quickly. Um, it sounds like China is going to be a bigger deal and they're not doing it in the same way we did. Um, I think that that lesson that other countries will draw and in fact are drawing from China uh, will be a mistake. I think almost certainly they'll be wrong in the long run. But the fact is the long run is a long way off. You can go quite a long way before you get to the long run. Um, of course, I think China itself will quite soon be bumping up against the constraints of government-controlled capitalism. It's worked pretty well so far. Uh, it's had an economy primed to adopt technologies from outside. I don't think their current system will work for innovation where strict hierarchies and control are anathema. China also has been helped a lot since 1979 by starting, in a sense, its new economic growth cycle with minimal accumulated wealth and almost not minimal sort of vested interests. A generation later, though, now, family wealth in China has all the kinds of attributes that you'd expect of a large government-controlled, somewhat corrupt system. Family wealth and entrenched corporate interests are already a serious break on China doing, pursuing more necessary reforms. And I think a more open system will be vital for China to keep growing. So the contest of I this century, free will, relatively free markets, and relatively state controlled markets. This is a battle which is, you know, the world has gone through many times. And I would say that the free art systems have virtually always won. Um, this time the contest will not be between capitalism and something else in the form of communism, fascism, or whatever you want to call it. It will be between different flavors of capitalism. It will be between sort of the free-ish market system that we see here versus the sort of semi-state owned, semi-monopoly system that you see propagated in China and quite a few other emerging markets um, uh, at this point. Regardless of the nuances, though, I don't think it's getting any easier over time for a government to run a complex leading edge economy. I think the fact is that once again, as time goes on, you're going to see the free market model winning out over the government, the government directed, government controlled model. And what that means, I think, is that in the end, either China will embrace capitalism in a form that's closer to what we would recognize, or it'll start to seize up. Now, it'll start to seize up when you start when your baseline is 7% economic growth. It may not be the most awful fate for quite a while. And even in a relatively negative scenario for what happens to China, it's probably still going to be the biggest economy, the biggest military. There's going to be a lot of changes out there that we will have to get used to. Uh, and I think that will probably be the salutary for, for us. Um, but it will, but unless China really kind of upends its current organization and its current form of capitalism to something much more, dare I say, Darwinian, um, I, I think they will continue to lag the West 
in per capita economic terms, they will still have a residue of poverty that will be hard to get rid of. Um, I'm not trying to argue that we have the balance just right here, or probably anywhere else either. Um, personally, I have all kinds of sort of recommendations and desires about how we should change intellectual property rights, environmental rules, progressive taxes, early childhood education. I mean, there's plenty of things that, that I think we do inadequately or wrong here, and we could do a lot better. Um, But what this means is that, the, in a way, the, the great sort of determinative battles of the next generation will probably be over all these nuances within capitalism. They will be about patent law and environmental regulation versus patent trade. They'll be about how progressive the tax system should be, about how you how many rights the government should have when taking property from people, about whether we should have public funding for daycare. And you know what? These little battles, little battles, sort of boringly incremental battles, they are the stuff of social transformation. They are what's going to determine whether, as we go through this century, we in fact live in a liberating, fulfilling world or in a kind of pressure cooker of insecurity and help. Um, I'm basically an optimist. I tend to see progress in all of these dimensions. I guess I'm liberal is what it comes down to. Um, it's, a lot of it is two steps forward and one step back. But I think we are likely to move to somewhere a little different on the spectrum, let's say, between the US and Sweden terms of the nature of our capitalist system. I don't think we're going to be heading back, I guess rightwards one might say, um, to a more laissez-faire, a more 19th century kind of approach to the economy, uh, even though there are obviously are people out there in, in the world who would argue for doing that. Uh, I think we're much more likely to head in a, in a direction where we perhaps trade off a little economic growth for a little more economic security. But to me, that seems like a sensible choice. There is an aside. I, I, I can't avoid this slightly more pessimistic thought as a possibility. I, it may be the result of watching Downton Abbey too much. Um, <laughs> a century ago, 1913, uh, think about it, the world looked probably equally globalized um, equally capitalist and progress looked equally unstoppable as it does now. What stopped it, in fact, what stopped that progress or you know derailed it substantially, wasn't any economic analysis of markets and free trade. It wasn't. I don't know whether it would even come under what the Mirage referred to as political economy. I mean, it was world wars and revolutions. What did it say? And I guess that points to, in a sense, the weakness of my argument. Because, I mean, capitalism's strength is basically that it harnesses basic human emotions of greed and you know, status seeking to be to productive ends, which status and that's invisible hand. The problem is that humans have some other equally basic drives, like you know, violence and xenophobia and genocide. You know, you, you only have to look at what happened in Yugoslavia when the country broke down, or, or even look at, you know, the behavior of chimpanzees, you know, which are pretty close to us. They all, those, those kinds of negative activities are, are pretty hardwired in them too. I just have to hope, I guess, that in the next century our rational minds will focus more on the, the positives of you know, devising a more liberated, liberal form of capitalism rather than descending into pre-capitalist savagery and, and war, because that certainly is what could derail this whole supposedly happy future. Uh, in the absence of wars, though, I definitely think that the range of viable alternative <coughs> policy choices in a major sense, is going to be narrowing over time. It's not that 
you know, it's not that if the world is flat and every country is going to be the same, uh, and it's not that there won't be space for all kinds of vigorous debates, but you know, the reality is that I think technological change, free communication, free-ish trade, uh, sort of squeezes the range of viable options. The countries are going to ha have a much harder time being radically different from each other in, their, in where they choose to locate themselves on that political spectrum, as it were, between the US and Sweden. Both those poles will probably be sustainable, but I, I think it will be hard to get anywhere much outside that in the range of options that countries will get to choose over the next half century. Um, I guess given that the title of the presentation of the future of capitalism, I should be saying something specific about what I expect. Uh, unfortunately, I work in the investment management business, and I learned that I never know what's going to happen. Um, people spend their time asking me what, what the future holds, and the standard answer is that if I knew, I wouldn't have to strap on a tie and coat, and I wouldn't have to go to work in the morning. You know, I might be talking to you by video from my yacht in the Caribbean or something. Uh, I don't know how these things are going to work out, and I don't think anybody else does either. But I do think that basically the signs are good, barring the potential for wars. You can see the, you can see the potential for world war anyway to get a look. You can see the potential for asteroids, you know, whatever you like. There, there's always some, some you know, scenarios out there in that field. But basically I see a a progressive, a liberal future that's where things are getting better than you know the intermittently awful but improving state that we see today. Uh, I'll shut up there, and I think we're we're supposed to have some time for Q and A. I promise we do have the Q and A. So if anyone wants to ask Mr. Shane some questions, please raise your hands. Uh, do you see a potential problem with the wealth divide being increasing over the next century, or do you think that the gaps in the close, and how do you think it will be closed? Sorry, I, I couldn't hear the, the first one. You said what is increasing? Oh, the wealth, wealth divide. Oh, the, yes, well, the wealth divide. It's certainly true that, you know, income inequality within countries has been getting worse and worse over the last few decades, I would say. Now, of course, at a global level, if you sort of look at the entire world population, it's actually been getting more equal because there are fewer poor Chinese people than there were before. And that effect dominates everything else in the data. Uh, but it's a real question, nonetheless. And I don't really know how to answer it because I don't know whether that trend is what's going to go on. Uh, the fact is, sort of, the the biggest trend of the last century was probably that we had increasing equality. But a lot of that happened in a short burst around World War II and the subsequent few decades. And it's an open question whether that's the freakish exception or whether sort of Karl Marx was right that you know, the capitalism was heading towards a situation where a few people would earn everything. Uh, I think that realistically, it has to do with some of these, again, these sort of boringly incremental things about education policy and who has access to what kind of opportunities in society um, and what kind of technological progress is taking place. Um, now, the fact is that when, when we have technical, technological change and new inventions are happening as they are now at a frenetic pace, every advance has two impacts. One is that it acts as a sort of force multiplier. It makes a skill, a skilled person more productive and more valuable, but at the same time, it's liable to replace certain skills of other people. And at different points in time, those two forces work out differently. So it seems recently that we've really been converging on a system where new technological advances have been making lots of skills obsolete, have been concentrating rewards among a tiny elite. You know, you've had sort of winner-takes-all economies. Uh, but I don't know that that's necessarily going to be the way it goes on. I mean, if it is, then you're heading for a problem. 
I mean, there really is the potential for crisis. And indeed, there's a potential response to that is to say that we should do things to throw sand in the gears of technical, technological change. You know, we should just try and slow things down a bit, you know, be a bit Luddite, maybe. You know, because clearly in the last 20 years, it's not clear that technical, you know, that advancing technologies have actually been good for the average person. If you're good for some people, and you know, if you're an app developer or something, now you've got a wide open field. But that's, it's, it's a huge issue that's hanging out there. And yes, it's, it's potential dynamite. Thank you very much. Just time to give one more. I was just wondering, and we seem to be separating the uh, possibility of war from the economic system. We currently operate, if you look through the history of war, they usually have an economic basis for them. So they usually fought over the control of resources. So I don't know how you can separate the two things. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely true. I mean, you, you know, the, you can point to various sort of nationalistic, imperialistic ambitions in the context of some wars. And in general, it seems like starting a war over resources is certain. Well, starting a little war over resources where you can just go and beat somebody up and take what you want. I mean, that's pretty rational. You under, we all kind of understand the nastiness, the effectiveness of that. Uh, triggering a world war over resources is kind of a whole different ball game, and I think has to be viewed as wildly irrational. Now, obviously, you don't do that on purpose, and you know the uh, the chances that oh, you know that China and Japan would get into a war, uh, or that you know, there'd be something you know. Russia and some of others of its neighbors would get into a war over natural resources. They're not, they're not zero. But it, it seems to me, and maybe I'm naive and delusional, it seems to me that the sort of interlocking systems of, that, of today's economy can lead to all kinds of skullduggery and game playing and sort of minor league violence. But I think a really major world war of the kind that knocks out Half the world's capital stock. Seems to be a different kind of thing, and I think it is not crazy to hope that that doesn't actually happen in this contest for resources. But, I mean, you're right that that's, you know, you can tell an economic story behind almost everything in history, and that, and that includes the, the nefarious stuff too. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Um, our next speaker is actually a Northeastern alumni, so she's back in her own turf. Uh, Rachel Menard, recent, co recent founder and current CEO of Menard Capital. She graduated from Northeastern in a degree in philosophy and journalism. Um, I actually first met Rachel about two years ago when I worked for her out in San Francisco on her new book. The Handbook, Speaking in Thumbs, The Handbook of Empathy. I highly recommend you guys check out the website. It's www.speakinginthumbs.com. Um, Rachel is one of the most interesting, uh, well-versed, and hard-working people I've ever met in my life. So please give her a big round of applause. Thank you, Mr. Constructing portfolios on Wall Street, as we've done for 20 years, or helping build hedge fund businesses, which I've done for 15. It's really predicated on exactly that. It's being able to figure out how to build trust and integrity and credibility with someone. And Wall Street, as I mentioned, have, it doesn't have a lot of that nomenclature of late, especially since uh, 08, as you've seen, and made off and all of these terrible dramas that have hit the, the press. A lot of it has come back to people who do just the opposite, who haven't been able to demonstrate the solidity of how they think and, and to be the, the acumen that they've used to be investing has been elusive and opaque. I think what's most profound right now is that all of my business globally, Wall Street, has become holistic in the following way. 
I used to, back in the 90s, walk into a room to sit with an endowment or sit behind those individuals for whom we were potentially going to different ways and manage their money. And it was under the auspice of having a product, something that already existed, something that was a living, breathing thing that we had netted. And we were selling them a product. And that has really since evolved in a huge way. Now we're selling a business. We're selling a solution. We're selling the major, demonstrating the ability to mitigate the four major risks of investing, which are headline risk, business investment, and operational risk. Those are the four. Headline risk, which is market sentiment, behavioral finance, which is essentially what's happening in the world that would prompt me to invest or not. The business, fixed variable costs, how do you keep the lights on, how do you incentivize your senior staff to stay, and then operations, which is the structural integrity of the business itself, and then risk, which is every facet of risk, from all those fancy skew and kurtosis words all the way to macro thematic thought on where one should invest for how long and the depth and duration of that investment. But if there's anything that I can leave you with in our discussions, it's a few things, three major things, one of which, which was just absolutely perfectly spoken to, which is the global nature of our, of, our, of our world now. The second of which is this meritocracy, where one has to prove that something, these are the key words, is verifiably, defensively true. I am as much a trial lawyer as I am a Wall Street investment business professional. I have to, in every meeting, be able to know enough about the client, the markets, the macro views of the world, to be able to contextualize what my clients or what I do in the context of a solution appropriate to the issue or need of the investor. And that's changed enormously. It is an exhausting job. Because I have to not only know everything about you, the risks, your concerns, your issues, but I have to know enough about your investment methodology, your thought process. I need to know what bugs you or what doesn't, so that when I'm talking, I'm actually being heard. I use this quote a lot, which is just because you have someone's attention does not mean you have someone's attention. It means you have to be worthy of it, you have to warrant it. And the discussions and meetings I have covering 25 countries for 20 years in every type of distribution channel, from sovereign wealth funds in the Middle East all the way to big family offices in Dubai, wherever we are in the world, it's always the same premise now which is to get out of selling something that is an existing thing and to listen better, hence the book on empathy, which, just as a quick aside, its definition is not how I see empathy. It's not being in someone else's shoes. To me, it's being able to understand, to identify, to understand and protect the insecurities of someone else. Because in fact, when you walk into a meeting, when you're down on Wall Street and you come into a meeting with investment professionals, you don't have to know how you're alike, and you don't have to know what your strengths are. You have to figure out in the room what the insecurities or fear of loss is of the people in the room, and how to ensure that you structured an argument to mitigate it. So it's a very different discussion. It's mathematics, but in a different way. It's linguistics, it's philosophy, it's, it's, it's economics, and it's fundamental, which is to understand the, the holistic merging of all of these disparate pieces in order to get people to see things differently. What I think is most profound as well is that it's really become the business of anything. If you watch anything on TV, it's always <coughs> the product in the context of the life you are already living. It's not imposing you or pushing it. It's meant to dovetail into the way that you live your life. And that's definitely true when thinking about fiscal policy, when thinking about any facet of constructing a portfolio today. Here's the old days. The old days you'd walk in and you'd have a product that was delivering incredible return and you sold it based on the classic risk return objectives and delivering non, non uh, correlated risk adjusted return to your portfolio. That was the pitch. And now the pitch is this you walk in with a blank piece of paper and you listen, literally. You listen for four hours. You figure out what their actuarial assumptions are, what their liabilities are. You understand their portfolio construction, risk management, you look at their asset allocation profile. And what you're selling, here's the key, is no longer a product, but it's actually the mechanics or the characteristics of the instruments that you may well be selling. It may not be you. You have a latitude now to say, we actually are not appropriate for you. Let me recommend you to someone who is. 
it's almost concierge style now in the discussions you have on Wall Street, where you really have to be much better and much more attuned to take detailed notes, all the notes that you take in class, that copious, exhaustive, exhausted hand of, of writing a litany of information. The edge now is defensible, actual, factual information. It's not spin. I try to get rid of the word market and marketing or sales and everything because it's not that. It's persuasion. Great book by Harvard, The Art of Persuasion. A lot of it comes down to the educational bent of what the product or the fund or the instrument is designed to do in context. And that's very much the way the current market is in, in, in the financial industry. You know, to that end, we're looking at changing fee models that are much more fair, that are based on fee for service versus a coming in getting paid a lot of money day one. Now it's based on actually laying in to a series of things that, that you said you can do. I think everything changed after 08 in a powerful way. I mean, I think it did as well if you look at any of the major crashes, 70s, 80s, all the way down to the uh, crisis of 1873 and the Great Depression. But I think more profound in 08 was the lack of trust. It was people looking at each other and not trusting the very people they worked with, really losing faith in each other. And I think we've worked very hard in the last five years to change the nomenclature around how we run meetings and evaluate risk and think about MAC reviews in the context of being an active fiduciary. And here's what's changed too. The definition of a fiduciary is to be an active steward of capital, irrespective of personal gain. So I am making a recommendation to you irrespective of its benefit to me. That's interesting. Very few people are doing that anymore. Because in fact, the very people that you are hiring for an objective point of view are themselves recommending products that they are running. So there's a huge conflict right now in the global financial markets between how people are actually getting paid, what they're actually offering, and the context of an objective opinion. How does one have an objective opinion when there's an illicit intention all the time to the decisions they make? And so we're called to task on that, thank goodness, in some ways, more than ever. And that's where the philosophy background comes in handy. A really structured, going back to me, I remember we've probably watched Kant and Hume and Wittgenstein and all this. All of it is really tied down to, if you can remember those days, the early premise of how something can be defensively true and then building the mechanism or the information, or more importantly, the evidence to corroborate it. So those are the discussions we're having now on Wall Street and all over the world. It's a different very different time, and this is why, in some ways, evidenced by the very optimistic discussion we had of the future of capitalism, there's an extraordinary inflection point for all people to be able to make meaningful inroad into capitalism, not because they have a pre-baked idea that they're jerry-rigging into, into anything, but because they're able to hear it differently and identify a solution that ideally would be the highest return on investment appropriate to the need of the client or the investor. And so those discussions are the discussions that I think are the most profound, because how we're thinking about the global market, having spent time in China and India recently, and all over the world, South Africa, and, uh, having these discussions in, in Stockholm about how do, you, how do you manage money as an active steward? How do you evaluate macro views of the market and construct portfolios that will inoculate the portfolio from risk? And how do you have an honest discussion with like-kind investors about what's actually happening to the degree that any of us know it, and our ability to plan accordingly? And all of that comes back to this very discussion, which is listening. We start every meeting with a blank piece of paper, with a few premises that we believe may well be true, and we slough all the noise away. We get rid of all the jargon, all the drama, all the nomenclature that just seems clever, but is actually irrelevant and pretty much noise. And we get down to the one core essence of how an investment idea is made. And how is it made? It's made on conviction. A portfolio is made on conviction. It's based on identifying what are the factors that someone uses to arrive at a conclusion, and how are those manifest in the portfolio based on the conviction of the individual and the factors of the, the knowledge they're using to make it. And so that is really it's a combination of, of economics and behavioral finance and linguistics and philosophy all tied into one. 
And so what one now needs before coming into these big asset management firms is a very different approach to understanding the global markets. And lastly, I'd like to also speak to what you do. Um, essentially, what's changed as well globally, and I was just overseas having this discussion with a few um, macroeconomists just about their view of the market, is this. It used to go from asset management. Then it moved over to SRI, which you may have heard of socially responsible investing, where you make an investment based on maybe altruistic or personal ideas of you don't want to invest in sin stocks in tobacco or in you know, any other, other type of sin stocks, whatever they may be. And now it's moved to impact investing. You've probably seen that all over the world right now. Where impact investing is not only am I making an investment that has a ethical or moral compass to it, which may well be my own, but that in fact I want to see the efficacy of my investments. I actually want to make an investment in education all over the world and go back and actually study its efficacy. Did it in fact do what I was hoping it would do? So imagine that, that wonderful changing tide now in the global market, which in the last 10 years really hadn't been as prevalent. And now, traveling around the world and having conversations with investors, these are the things that they're starting to think about. They're thinking a lot about, about how not to use thousands and thousands of, of uh, plastic bottles and instead of bring your own. There's a sense of, of moral and personal and social obligation. Maybe I'm an optimist, maybe I'm an idealist, but I feel that I've seen it more. And I think that very few people on Wall Street anymore suffer fools. You can't come in with a, with a clever slip or a shoe because they, or, or a material because the opening question is, how did you arrive at what I'm looking at? Walk me through the proof of how you've been able to deliver this. So nothing is what it seems like more. And so one is best served to think about almost a lawyeristic standpoint of, of being able to defend that and have that mechanism in place, especially as it evolved now from the classic asset allocation profile to now impact investing which has really taken off, especially overseas, where it's a longer sales cycle. I'm not going to know right away if my investment's held up, but I'm willing to take the time to watch the long-term efficacy of those thoughtful decisions. So I do believe that there's a changing tide amongst all of us, both a moral compass, but also this holistic asset allocation program, a evaluation of the global market and your evidence to show proof and context and a solution versus having constructed something that you're confident is going to be the best idea. There's too many impacts, there's too many things that can go wrong in many ways for that to sustain itself. Better served, one would think, to step back and actually have some investment theses that themselves you can defend, around which you build the company, around which you build, you build a product. So I think that's what's changed since a year ago when we've been here, let alone 30, or however long it's taken to even that. So um, it's a very different education one has to have now in that context. And I think that there's a great line that says, knowledge without action is trivia. It's kind of tongue in cheek. But I guess the idea is that it's great to know a lot of things, but unless you're actually doing something about them or affecting them in any context, it's just stuff you know. And it's great to be smart, it's great to know things. I sit with investors all the time that, you know, all of them have four PhDs in applied math and they're constructing very complex optimization models using all these scenario analyses. But when you go to actually explain how they think about an idea, they can't arrive at it. They can't impart it to someone else. And so it's lost. It's kind of forever locked behind a smart mind without its ability to actually communicate. So communication today and taking these macro ideas or even these minute ideas and actually affect them in a conversation, especially with investors today, is also, is also paramount. And I guess before going to questions, I think the, the thing that I'm hoping that I could leave you with as well is that what do I do well? I think investors right now, especially on Wall Street, I worked at JP Morgan for years and all these other firms, and they're having these offsets right now as we speak. And it's a whiteboard. And the whiteboard isn't how to make money. But the whiteboard is how do we sustain what we think we do well? And how do we verify through a third party that it's actually true? How do we actually believe? How can we actually defend what we do? 
and what are the products that we're going to build in the next 10 or 15 years appropriate to those things that we can kind of tether into the earth, you know, the maple around which everything is, is revolving. And so those are the discussions right now that all the big banks and big firms are having. Sure, they're looking at run rate revenue, EBITDA, they're looking at all the classic, you know, bottom line P&L aspects of the business, but there's something way more profound right now that's happening, which is determining how they will survive what's going to be a change in regulation, a change in global impact by other competitors, and the ability to make sure that the thing that they really do do well is defensively so. And those are the discussions I'm having all the time. Again, back to the blank piece of paper. So the exercise you're probably all doing every day in some context is exactly what people around the world right now are doing from a financial standpoint. To look at long-term efficacy, holistic co concentration, combination of, of, of talent around the world. Um, and I think that's the solution, is proof. I think it all comes down to proof now. And our business is really predicated on that and this successful, I think, because people look to that. So I hope that's helpful. It gives a little perspective from a, from a, a Wall Street hedge fund in, investor for the last 20 years. Uh, how ironic that there wasn't a class here that really focused on that, except sitting with two teachers who you probably still have, Holbrook Robinson and Billy DeAngelis. I don't know if you guys ever had them, but we used to sit for hours, 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 hours up in Gloucester on the weekends and sit there and tear apart theses on on every facet of philosophy and linguists, every, every facet of, it, of, of thought to try to arrive at how to rightfully defend something one believes. So it seems so obvious, and yet that is really going to be, that is your penultimate personal currency that you're going to be using to, to make money, uh, manage money, and protect it. So I hope that's helpful, and I hope that to the Q&A. Again, we uh, reserve some time for questions. So, I have some questions. <coughs> Start the front here. Thank you. So, uh, when you refer to the blank slate strategy of going to meetings to meet with your first client who may or may not be investing, is that something that just you are doing, or are there some big firms that are still sticking to the let's try to sell things to people, and, or is it really like an entire I really am watching an industry-wide shift, and here's why, because you've already, it's an assumption you, you don't have the latitude or privilege to make anymore, right? I don't have the privilege or the time. You've got 20 other people that are vying for this investor's attention, maybe it's the MacArthur Foundation, or Aspirin, or the Northeastern University Endowment, make it up. So by having that window, you want to do as much work as you can ahead of time to have it in your back pocket so that there's a context in the discussion you're having. But the end mission is actually listening to get it down so that when you have a second meeting, your portfolio of the fund that you're selling, or ideally persuading one to, to invest in, has a context, a living, breathing context, versus it being assumptive that I have what you want. So it actually is a discussion that just about every Wall Street firm is having now, where they'll have the materials on the side, but the real liquid gold, the real moment is being able to capture all of the, getting the investor to talk and getting all that information and then coming back with a better argument and a better conclusion and, and solution to their need, which by the way may not be you. So that's another discussion that's powerful. Is how many times have there been meetings for one, two hundred, three hundred million dollars where we've actually tipped our hat and said, while well, we could do this, we actually don't have the acumen or resources or staff or talent or whatever infrastructure to do it well. So we'd like to recommend other people. That reciprocity between investors today is also a bit more prevalent and it's nice to see. Thank you. Sure. Back here. Um, you were discussing about how um, the skills that you wrote in philosophy like persuasion and just maybe get an argument are like actually want to be more than any economics philosophy could here. Do you think if you could communicate that better? To like a good, like wider population, then it would make it like I guess you could like inspire people and like who maybe like can't afford an education or things like that. I love the idea. Yeah, yeah I'm working on a second book, which is the art of the institutional sale, and the idea is to give somebody a guide, which is like literally a manual that walks them through that process. But a lot of it is from classes I took at MIT. There was some of the UBC at Harvard back then. You could take. 
the age you take classes at other like kind of universities if you were an honor student or whatever. And so what we would do is, you know, you, you studied all these incredible philosophers really around and having to stand up like this with one thesis and to be able to defend and validate it with people kind of coming at you. Welcome to Wall Street. I mean, that is all you're doing every day. The difference is you have, a, you have an investment fund with returns on the bottom, but operational business headline investment risk has to be defended now. And you have to memorialize it on paper. It's not enough to be serial about it. And you, the trust us mechanism doesn't work anymore. You really are a trial lawyer or a philosopher where you have to get into the structural argument of how to defend the validity of a thought. So yes, I love the idea. It's something that I'm, I'm trying to do, albeit slowly. I'm not as talented as Mr. Tom Steer at writing books, so it's, it's been a three and a half year rule to get there. So that's the hope. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one more. Okay. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I just had a more general question. When it comes to sort of being a CEO, when you said you come in with a blank piece of paper understanding, what they're sort of expecting from you. Did you ever take on sort of the responsibility of yourself as a manager, as a CEO, and sort of just like a sort of a light take on what you're expecting through your own position, what power you have in order to influence other people to say, go into more impact investing or more sort of helpful in a sense, more social benefits it's investing? A great, yeah, it's a great question. I'm not a CEO myself, so although I've sat on investment committees for 18 years, I haven't been an active fiduciary, although I do sit on two endowments as a trustees of fiduciary, but in the context of my current firm, I work with the CIOs, I work with the head of risk at these firms to really try to evaluate which of their products would be appropriate for what audience at what time. So that entire argument or, or mechanism is something that exactly what we do. So it's, uh, it's trying to set the CIO who's convinced that he has a great investment idea and actually canvas a global market to come back and say, in fact, this is true, this happened, no one wants what you have. It's a commodity. It's replicable. It's not worth the fees that you're charging. And there's no market share. There's no groundswell for what you have. And no one would see you as a natural extension from being good at it. It's a very sobering, hard thing to hear. Uh, but that level of discourse is what we have with CIOs to make sure that they're not wasting time and resources and, and ideas on things that just aren't ever going to evolve. Thank you. And I just wanted to let you know, Billy DeAngelo's retired a little while ago. Yeah, no, thanks. <laughs> I miss him. He's a good man. Thank you all very much. Our final speaker of the evening is Professor Noam Chomsky. Uh, Chomsky has been a linguist, a philosopher, a cognitive scientist, logician, historian, political critic, and activist. He has taught at MIT for over 50 years and is one of the most respected and cited professors of our time. Professor Chomsky had once challenged intellectuals to question that that we hear in the media and what politicians tell us, and has done so himself by publishing over 100 books and a plethora of different topics. This is the second consecutive year that Professor Chomsky has agreed to come speak at our symposium, and please help me uh, welcome him and honor him. from government 
institutions like procurement, which is a major way to uh, uh, advance uh, technology, a huge way. And in fact, it was really, if you look at it, it's about the 30 years, primarily in the state sector, the period of the greatest creativity, innovation, and so on. But before it was handed over to uh, uh, what's called private enterprise, largely the government subsidized to uh, 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 de develop it further for the commercial market. Uh, that was the role of Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, and so on. But the work had already been done, basic work. Uh, and uh, if you look at biology-based industries, it's about the same. And furthermore, if you go back, say, to the 19th century, the uh, development of the famous uh, uh, American mass production system, which uh, you know, amazed the world, but mostly government armories uh, and so on. And it's pretty natural. That's the place where costs are borne by the public. And why should private power want to pay for things if the public will do it for them? Uh, so it's very, it's, it's very characteristic aspect of really existing capitalism. And there are many other. And so one that everybody knows right now, and should have known about before, is the uh, government uh, insurance policy for uh, uh, major financial institutions called Too Big to Fail, uh, which encourages uh, risky uh, transactions, um, maximizes risk because it's pretty safe. If a risky transaction makes a lot of profit, uh, if it collapses, uh, the any state comes and bails you out, and you go on with uh, one of the directors of the Bank of England, recently called a doom cycle, where each one worse than the last, beginning in the early 80s uh, uh, with the so-called neoliberal period, and each one worse than the last, we're now moving on to the next one. Uh, so that's called capitalism, and I'll use the word, but uh, I don't know what it has to do with capitalism. A limited market. There is a limited uh, uh, market uh, uh, element, although even that's pretty limited, because this the advanced sectors of the society, the major ones, are highly monopolized. Uh, and that's been increasing very rapidly in uh, recent years. So, uh, since uh, about mid-90s, the share of profits of the 200 largest enterprises have rapidly risen. And of course, all of that undermines market competition in well-known ways. Uh, what are, there's a related concept, related to capitalism as democracy. So I'd also like to talk about really existing democracy. Uh, democracy is a contested term like capitalism, but at least there's one condition that it ought to be, a minimal condition, that uh, public opinion uh, plays some kind of a role in determining policy. Uh, if it doesn't have that property, it's not democracy. But if you look at really existing democracy, that's not true. Uh, so in, it's a topic that happens to be very well studied in professional political science, or study uh, attitudes, which is easy to investigate in the United States, very heavily polled society, we know a lot of what people think. And policy, of course, you look at policy. And the results are quite interesting. It turns out that if at the, say, the, roughly the bottom 70, of the wealth income scale is going with no influence on policy. Politically, it's just not paying attention to them. Uh, as you move up the scale, you get a little more influence. But you get to the very top, uh, basically, they get what they want. Uh, so the system is essentially a plutocracy. It's uh, a cold democracy, and we can call it that if you like. Uh, the public, incidentally, quite well aware of this. They may not know the details that you find in technical articles, but uh, kind of aware of how it works. The poll just a couple of days ago, which is pretty typical, uh, asked people whether they thought that Congress represented the people. Uh, the number was 11 percent. It's a little higher than it's been in the past, so maybe it's improving. Uh, there have been uh, a lot of debates over the years, you know, interesting, 
philosophical debates about whether capitalism and democracy are even compatible. Okay, you can debate it. But I think we can say that uh, the answer, the question's been answered for really existing capitalist democracy. Uh, they're not compatible. Uh, we see it right in front of us. Uh, I also want to ask a question about really existing capitalist democracy. Uh, namely, uh, can civilization survive it? I think that question is going to be answered uh, probably within your lifetimes, uh, maybe not very far ahead. And very likely the answer will be negative. And I think it's uh, uh, worth paying a little attention, a lot of attention to that. Uh, I'll try to give the reason. Uh, we might ask, incidentally, whether a functioning democracy might alleviate this danger. I think there's some reason to think so. So I'm just going to, let's keep now to the most critical, immediate problem that human civilization faces, that the human species faces. There's something new in the history of the species. Uh, environmental catastrophe. Not a joke. Very serious. Probably imminent. Uh, here, policies and attitudes that differ, diverge radically, as is very often the case in really existing capitalist democracy. Actually, the, if you want details, the nature of the gap is explored in several papers in the current issue of uh, the Journal of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And uh, what they show is that uh, looking at policy, of uh, 110 relevant countries, uh, 109 have a national uh, policy to deal with environmental problems. One doesn't, the typical uh, case of the, the most advanced case of really existing capitalist democracy, thus. Uh, 118 countries have set targets for renewable energy. One hasn't the same. Now, it's not public opinion that drives policy off the international spectrum. Exactly the opposite. Uh, public opinion happens to be pretty close to the international norm. Uh, and uh, you can quote some of the details if you want, but it's easily demonstrated. Now, that fact is the fact that the public is influenced by science is deeply troubling to those who dominate the economy and the political system. Uh, one current illustration of their concern is an interesting program called the uh, Environmental Literacy Improvement Act. It's being proposed to legislatures right now by uh, ALEC, that's the American Legislative Exchange Council, as you may know it's a corporate-funded uh, lobby that designs legislation for states uh, to serve the needs of the corporate sector and extreme wealth. Well, the ALEC Act mandates what they call balanced teaching of climate science in K-12 classrooms. Uh, balanced teaching is a code phrase that means teaching uh, uh, climate change denial to balance mainstream science. It's analogous, analogous to uh, what's called a balanced teaching that advocated by creationists to enable creation science to be taught alongside uh, what they call uh, evolution science, in other words, science. Uh, the, uh, it's all dressed up, of course, in uh, nice rhetoric about teaching thinking and so on. Uh, but it's not hard to think up a uh, critical thing is a good idea, but it's not hard to think up ways to teach uh, critical thinking that are not designed to advance corporate profits and that do not threaten the existence of the species. Uh, the, these are based on uh, conceptions that there's, that there's a controversy, they say there's a controversy, major controversy, over whether humans are changing the web. I feel like the media, there is indeed a controversy. And it's interesting to see the way it lines up. Uh, on one side, uh, there's the overwhelming majority of scientists 
uh, every one of the world's major national academies of science, uh, virtually everything, everything virtually in the science journals, the professional science journals, the uh, international uh, uh, IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on uh, Climate Change, they all agree that uh, it's, it's happening, uh, that there's a major human component, uh, that the situation is serious and possibly dire, and that very soon, probably within decades, we might reach a tipping point where it becomes irreversible. And uh, then after that, it get nonlinear processes, starts to escalate, and it's out of control. It's, it's rather rare to find a consensus of that kind on any complex scientific issue, but it is in this case. Well, that's one side of the debate in the media. The other side of the debate is uh, uh, the skeptics. That, that actually includes a few respected sciences, a handful of quite respected scientists, who caution that a lot is unknown, which is true. And the fact that a lot is unknown means it could be not as bad as the consensus thinks, or it could be a lot worse than consensus thinks. That's what it means to say a lot is unknown. Now, there's something omitted from this contrived debate. Now, that's a very large number of skeptics, quite a large number among mainstream uh, climate scientists. That to include the climate change group at MIT, for example. And they're skeptics because they regard the consensus as much too conservative. And they've repeatedly been proven correct over recent years, to give you examples. But they're not even part of the debate, uh, although they're very prominent in the scientific literature. Well, uh, this uh, Alec campaign, others like it, are part of a huge campaign by corporate lobbies to try to sow doubt uh, that human activities are having a major impact on global warming with possibly ominous implications. Actually, the campaign was pretty openly announced, uh, publicly announced by the Chamber of Commerce, named Business Lobby, uh, the Petroleum, or Petroleum Institute, and uh, others. Uh, uh, however, it's worth bearing in mind that the efforts of uh, Alec and the famous Cook brothers who were commonly brought up but that's just a small fraction of what's underway. Uh, the initiatives are pretty massive, and they're concealed in all sorts of arcane ways. Sometimes it's partially revealed. Just a study that came out that found, I'll quote it, that conservative billionaires used a secretive funding group to channel nearly $120 million to more than 100 groups casting doubt about uh, the science behind climate change, and helping to build a vast network of think tanks and activist groups working to a single purpose to redefine climate change from normal scientific fact to a highly polarizing wedge issue for hardcore conservatives. Conservatives, another term that I don't think ought to be used. I think they were radicals. Uh, the, this, uh, propaganda campaign, primarily in the United States, has had some effect on public opinion, so it appears that U.S. public opinion is a little more skeptical than the global norm. But the effect is not significant enough to satisfy those who want to become Smith called the masters of mankind. Uh, that's presumably why they're uh, major sectors of the corporate world are launching their uh, attack on the educational system to try to counter the dangerous tendency of the public to pay attention to science. Uh, you may remember that a couple of weeks ago at the Republican National Committee's winter meeting, uh, Governor Bobby Jindal of uh, Louisiana have warned the leadership but we must stop being the stupid party. We must stop insulting the intelligence of voters. Now, uh, Alec and its corporate backers, in contrast, want this to be the stupid nation for very principled reasons, and they're working hard on it. Uh, one of the dark money organizations that's uh, of billionaires funding 
climate change denial is uh, called donor's trust. It's uh, also, it turns out, to be a major contributor to the current efforts uh, to deny voting rights to blacks. It's coming up in one aspect. That's coming up in the Supreme Court now. And that makes good sense. Uh, blacks tend to be Democrats. And if that wasn't bad enough, they tend to be social Democrats, uh, supporting welfare state measures. And what's worse, it's likely that they're escaping training in critical thinking and may uh, have a dangerous tendency to pay attention to the sciences. <laughs> the major science journals regularly give a sense of how surreal all of this is. I'll give a couple of current examples. I'll keep to science, the major science people. A couple of weeks ago, I had three news items side by side. The one reported that 2012 was the hottest year on record in the United States. That's continuing a long trend. Uh, the second reported a study by the U.S. Global Climate Change Research Program, which provided new evidence of uh, rapid climate change as a result of human activities, discussed severe impacts. The third news item reported the new appointments to chair the Committees on Science Policy chosen the House of Representatives. Uh, in the House of Representatives, a minority of voters elected a substantial minority of Republicans, that's thanks to one of the ways of shredding the democratic system that's been carried out under really existing capitalist democracy. Uh, all three of the new cha chairs deny uh, that humans contribute to climate change. Two of them deny that it's even taking place. Uh, one is a long-time advocate for the fossil fuel industry. Actually, the same issue of the journal has a detailed technical article with uh, uh, new evidence that the irreversible tipping point uh, may be ominously close. Uh, go back to right now, the current issue of science uh, underscores the need to ensure that we must be the stupid main nation. Uh, the article uh, reports new evidence that, that even very slightly warmer temperatures, less than what is anticipated, uh, is very likely to start melting permafrost. Now that in turn, that does set off one of these nonlinear processes. It triggers uh, the release of very high amounts of greenhouse gas, uh, trapped in ice. So you can see that it's best to keep to balanced education, uh, at least if we can look our grandchildren in the face. Uh, with uh, really existing capitalist democracy, it's extremely important that we become the stupid nation, not misled by science and rationality uh, in the interests of uh, the short-term gains of the masters. Uh, the, these commitments also are deeply rooted in the market fundamentalist doctrines that are preached within really existing capitalist democracy. I stress preached because uh, they're not observed. They're observed in a highly selective manner. So it's to sustain a very powerful state that serves wealth and power. But just keeping the official doctrines, they do suffer from a number of familiar uh, what are called market inefficiencies in the technical literature. Among the market inefficiencies is uh, one crucial one, namely the fact that uh, the effects on others aren't, don't enter into market, the market transactions, one of the externalities. Uh, the consequences of these externalities can be quite substantial. In fact, the current financial crisis is an example. Uh, the, what's not taken into account when, say, Goldman Sachs makes a transaction or something is what's called systemic risk. Uh, the risk that the whole system will collapse if it crashes. Uh, and uh, 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 that's, uh, and there's something similar in the case of environmental catastrophe. It's far more serious, though. Uh, here, the externality that's ignored is the fate of the species. And in this case, there's nowhere to run cap in hand uh, to get bailed out uh, after you've uh, created a massive crisis. We're living with that right now. Well, these
consequences have deep roots in really existing capitalist democracy and in its, uh, the doctrines that it professes, doesn't live up to them, but that it professes, like market fundamentalism. Uh, uh, and that's one reason, not the only one, where I think it's uh, pretty unlikely that civilization will survive a really existing capitalist democracy without uh, pretty severe blows. Well, final comment. I suppose the, uh, a future historian, uh, if there is one, and that's not obvious, would look back uh, at a rather curious spectacle that's taking place right now. Uh, for the first time in human history, uh, humans are facing a very significant prospect of severe calamity as a result of actions that they're quite consciously undertaking. Uh, and there is a range of reactions. At one extreme, there are those who are trying to act to prevent uh, possible catastrophe. At the other extreme, there are major efforts underway to deny what's happening and to bring on the catastrophe as far as possible. Uh, leading the effort to bring on the catastrophe is the richest and most powerful country in the world, in world history. Uh, with incomparable advantages. And the most prominent example of uh, uh, really existing capitalist democracy, the leading the effort to preserve conditions in which our immediate descendants that might have a decent life are the so-called primitive societies, First Nations, the Aboriginal, Indigenous, uh, whatever they're called. Uh, the countries that have large and influential indigenous populations are well on the lead in the effort to preserve the planet. And the countries that have driven indigenous populations to extermination or marginalization, uh, they're the ones who are in the lead in trying to uh, uh, bring the crisis as, as close as possible. So for example, take Ecuador, uh, which has large that's why a large indigenous population has oil. But right now it's seeking aid from the rich countries to help them keep the oil underground. Let's go to the opposite end, the US and Canada, the richest and most powerful countries. Now here we're enthusiastically seeking to burn fossil fuels, including the extremely dangerous Canadian tar sands, and to do so as quickly and fully as possible, uh, while at the same time leaders are hailing the wonders of a largely meaningless century of energy independence, without a side glance at what the world would look like uh, in 100 years or even less if this, we continue this extravagant uh, commitment to self-destruction. And in fact, the observation generalizes that throughout the world, indigenous societies are struggling uh, to protect what they call often the rights of nature, while the civilized and sophisticated us uh, are scoffing at this silliness. That's exactly the opposite of what rationality would predict, unless we mean the skewed form of rationality that passes through the distorting filters of really existing capitalist democracy. Thanks. We have time for a few questions. If you guys want to raise your hands, I'll come bring the mic around just like last time. Um, you mentioned that the masters, as you said, uh, would like to keep kind of keep uh, the scientific truth of climate change from reaching, you know, the masses. To what end, I would ask, um, do these people, are these people stupid? Do they not think that a, a global climate catastrophe would affect them? Or are they blind to it? No, well, it's uh, working on standard market principles. You're trying to maximize short-term uh, profit and market share. That's what it means to be uh, at the manager of a corporation. You don't worry much about what's going to happen down the road. In fact, by now, after the changes the last 30 years, changes in 
state introduced changes, incidentally, in corporate and rules of corporate governance and so on, that's even more true than it was in the past. I mean, in the past, if you go back, say, to the 1950s uh, in the United States, the major corporations had a kind of a stake in the society, you know, kind of famous examples. Going back farther, there's Henry Ford raising wages to five dollars for people to buy his cars. Uh, but if you go back to the 1950s, it's still true. So they had GM, say, uh, GE. Uh, they had a stake in the health of the society. That's much less true today. But with the radical changes in the way the economy was designed, and I mentioned designed because it was purposeful and conscious, there were alternatives. <coughs> Roughly in the late 70s, going on through the Reagan years and on, it was redesigned to uh, uh, sharply increase the role of finance, of financialization. Uh, by 2007, when the latest crash hit, the financial institutions had about 40% of corporate profits, which was colossal. Uh, go back to the big growth period of the 50s and 60s, the banks were banks. Uh, they weren't even interstate banks, let alone huge investment firms. And there was a lot of regulation. The regulation was in place, so you know, no crisis. Uh, but there's a big shift towards financialization and also towards uh, export of production. So that, again, has always happened, goes back to the early 19th century, but it really took off uh, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, along with that goes uh, rapid concentration of wealth, it's gone way up, and concentration of wealth carries along almost reflexively concentration of political power, which leads to legislation, which carries the vicious cycle further. Uh, but the end result is that, uh, you know, say, Apple or Google or GE, they don't care that much about the domestic population here. They got their workforce elsewhere in places where you can uh, get cheap labor under hideous conditions don't worry about any constraints, and they uh, uh, have a kind of a global market. Actually, the situation was pretty well described in a, a, a brochure that was put out by Citigroup a couple of years ago. The Citigroup is this huge banking conglomerate, which uh, once again is the feeding at the public trough, of, as it's been doing ever since the early 1980s. Its predecessor in the early 1980s, the crash, you go to taxpayer tells you out for doing it again. Uh, but they put out a brochure for investors, which is worth reading. Uh, it uh, urged investors to keep to what they call their plutonomy index, which apparently way outperformed the general index of stocks since the 80s, since the Reagan years. Uh, plutonomy means the wealthy, the very wealthy, globally. I mean, they happen to be concentrated heavily in the United States and England and a couple other countries, but it's all over. You go to a sub-Saharan country, there are people with spectacular wealth. So just pay attention to the plutonomy, uh, the ones where you know, the very wealthy, and uh, the rest we can kind of forget about. Actually, there's a name for the rest. They're sometimes called the precariat, people who live a precarious existence. And it's advisable that people be driven to the precariat. And sometimes that's even said by the gurus of the modern economy. The, uh, Alan Greenspan, for example, and he was still St. Alan, you know, before uh, everything crashed. But uh, back in the late 90s, when he was testifying in Congress, and he was hailing the wonderful economy he was running, he explained to Congress that it's based uh, substantially on what he called growing worker insecurity, which is a very healthy thing from the point of view of economic theory. Because if workers are insecure, they're not going to ask for higher wages and benefits, uh, and therefore you can make more profit. Uh, so they're always doing fine. So we have a global precariat and a global plutonomy, and they're not you know, the area from country to country. And, and that's the real shift in the economy. It's not from the US to China, it's mostly myth. But there is a shift towards a global split between a plutonomy and a precarity. But that means 
that uh, the ones who own and manage the economy just care less than before about their own society as long as it continues to provide a powerful state which can bail them out when they get into trouble, uh, can protect them from adverse consequences, uh, and uh, can keep uh, producing the uh, innovations and creative activity that drive the economy forward. And that's what we're moving towards. Thank you. Um, do you think the system of bailing out financial institutions when they collapse, do you think that uh, system can be continued without bringing out about either hyperinflation with increasing the money supply or a change in the monetary system? The increased financialization. It's kind of interesting. After the last, after the crash a couple of years ago, uh, there were some articles in the professional economics journals for the first time really uh, saying that there's been a kind of a gap in the economics profession we haven't really asked uh, whether the financial institutions have a positive or negative impact on the economy it's pretty dramatic when you think how they've exploded in the last 40 years and a number of them said uh, robert solo at mit uh, Nobel laureate was one of them, but if we did investigate uh, this question, we'd probably find that they have a generally harmful effect. Actually, some take a much stronger stance. So the most uh, respected financial correspondent in the financial correspondent in the English-speaking world, I think, is probably Martin Wolf of the Financial Times, the economist highly respected. And he describes the financial institutions as uh, uh, like a larva that eats away at its host from the inside. The host is the market system. And I think there's some evidence that that's true. So can we go on? Well, you know, I quoted the, I referred to the director of the Bank of England who says we're in a doom loop and describes why. And it's uh, pretty well understood uh, with the, the government insurance policy which runs tens of billions of dollars a year to the big banks, encourages risk. Now, there is a weak legislation, the Dodd-Frank bill, which, which is really just the framework of legislation. It has to be filled out in detail. And ever since it was passed, the uh, industry lobbyists are hard at work to try to make sure that it doesn't mean anything and that it probably succeed. Uh, which means, yes, we'll be in further doom loop. So that's one problem. That's one crisis that's coming along, escalating. I think it's sort of inherent in the system. So that one you could modify, you know, like by sensible regulation and so on. But there's another one that you may not be able to modify, the one I was talking about, that we may come, be coming to a point not too far in the future uh, where it'll be impossible to do it. And as I said, in a financial crisis, the big banks can you know, run to the nanny state to be bailed out. Nobody to run to in this case. That was all we had time for. You guys want me to see it for a second? Put one more round of applause for Professor Chomsky. Individualism, the freedom of choice, and the competition synonymous with capitalism have brought technological material wealth to many. A system that was touted for only benefiting large scale capital owners and first world elites has been modified throughout the years to now include a much larger share of the population, including the middle class, and as we can see, the continual process of millions being pulled out of poverty. As a larger share of the global population gains a voice and a form to express it, it would not make sense to support any new economic discussion or social discourse in an effort to perpetuate a status quo. Uh, one only needs to observe history to see that change is inevitable. 
Any attempts to resist it for the purpose of keeping around what is comfortable and familiar will only impede us as a society, as the current solutions and techniques are not tailored to solve the problems of the future. Rather, we must embrace change to economic and social structures that were never destined to be static in the first place, using acquired knowledge, wisdom, and new technologies and direct them in a manner that can benefit society as a whole. One thing I've learned, uh, possibly to this dismay of some professors and the relief of students, is that economics is a study that cannot be fully grasped by any single textbook or theory. There wouldn't be so many of them if that were true. <laughs> Limiting economic discourse to one single rigid school of thought would be putting ideology over pragmatism. Ultimately, economics revolves around people, the choices they make, and the interactions they have with one another. And unlike the, uh, unlike the principles that are sound in Newtonian physics, per se, uh, the system of exchanges and interactions between people that we call the economy is ever-changing. Tonight, we hope to investigate this uncertain future of our global economy by having three brilliant, brilliant people, Bill Cheney, Rachel Leonard, and Noam Chomsky, each with different areas and backgrounds of expertise to hypothesize the possible changes that capitalism may undergo in the coming years. Uh, a question that only time has to answer to. So I'd like to once again thank all three of our speakers, as well as the economics department, <coughs> Professor Dana, and all of you as well for joining us in this exploration of the future of global capitalism. Thank you.